turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 28. We're going to start looking, uh, it's verse 16, it's verse 16, verse 16, down to the end of the chapter. We are, of course, in the post-resurrection. We know from not just this gospel, but other gospels, that after that first great and glorious Easter Sunday, that Jesus spent a total of 40 days appearing to the disciples, and with each appearance, strengthening their faith and teaching them something new. And now those 40 days are coming to a close, and Jesus is preparing to finally close out this portion of his earthly ministry. And here we have what is going to be, you know, not quite his last words. We'll look at those when we begin the book of Acts on the Ascension. But this is the, the second last thing that he's going to say to them. So verse 16 of Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to that reading. I mentioned in the introduction, sometimes you prepare a, uh, a sermon to preach as part of your schedule. Sometimes, like a deer in headlights, something leaps up into either your life or the life of the congregation or the greater culture around you. And the man behind the pulpit needs to make a decision. Is this something that needs to be immediately addressed? And this week, that exact thing happened to me. And also, coincidentally, it was the very next thing that we would have been looking at anyway. Uh, I attribute that to divine providence when that lines up. What are we looking at this morning? The Great Commission. The Great Commission. Now, for a while now, I have been concerned that the contemporary Canadian church has lost sight of who and what it is supposed to be. I've been here enough months now, I, I hope I've made that clear, that that's one of my driving ministry imperatives, is to recover and teach again what I, I'm cons deeply concerned, deeply concerned that we have lost. We're in decline. I don't think there can be any argument about that. We are in decline, and that decline, in no small part, I believe, started when we stopped using and teaching certain terms and concepts that are decidedly Christian. For example, at some point, we started talking about spiritual development. Even in some of my courses at seminary, we talked about the spiritual development of either the congregation or the spiritual development of the ministering person. And although those courses were wonderful and had some excellent reading in them, and I did learn a lot, I did walk away from at least one of them, the spiritual development of the ministering person, with one major complaint. Why were we not talking about sanctification? Sanctification. We started using spiritual development. We stopped using a word like sanctification. Why? Maybe because the latter word sounds very churchy. It sounds almost Roman Catholic, high Anglican. It's a very churchy sounding word. And I'm almost positive that at some point over the past several decades, there was an intentional decision to stop using words like that because they tend to turn off people that may be coming into our church, that we're inviting into our church. We don't want to just dump on them with a bunch of churchy terms, make them feel bad, make them feel like outsiders. That's what I strongly suspect. However, in doing so, that may have been well-intentioned, but in doing so, we apparently forgot that any faith, any one, can spiritually form themselves. There is a plethora of faith narratives out there in the world that can offer you spiritual formation. But only the Lord God Almighty can sanctify. 
Only he can sanctify. Here's another example. We also stop talking about justification. I know I've brought this up before. Justification. We stopped using that. We stopped using words like righteousness, holiness, or rather, I should say, we stopped using these exact terms when talking about them. We, we found other ways to describe them. And as a result, there are Christians today who have absolutely no idea what any of this means if you try to talk about it or expound on it or deepen it or teach it. Let me say this. The Christian faith, the Christian faith has a very specific and unique vocabulary to it. Because the faith is unique. And when we start watering down our vocabulary, when we start swapping some of these words out for the more common vernacular, I am deeply concerned that inadvertently, maybe, we also end up watering down the thing that we're trying to talk about. So, for example, we say we're made right with God instead of justified. Why is justified important? Justified, if we know it, if we employ that word, carries all kinds of courtroom attachments to it. The entire human race will someday, maybe soon, stand before the great courtroom of God with Jesus presiding as judge. And for some of us, advocate. For some of us, but not all of us. So have we dropped the usage of a term like justification because we don't want to remind potential Christians, newcomers, to the church of this harsh reality. Why do they need to repent? Why do the unsaved need to come to Christ and be saved? Because they will someday stand in that great courtroom. And unless Christ is also acting as their advocate, as their defense lawyer, they're going to owe a debt they cannot pay. And as I have said many times, I'm not making this up. It's in the manual. Unable to pay that debt, they will be thrown into the eternal debtor's prison that goes by the name of hell. So, this is my worry, that by not employing the vocabulary that rightfully belongs to us, that most accurately describes us, we are watering ourselves down along with watered-down doctrine, along with watered-down beliefs. Here's a case in point, and this is what prompted this this morning. A Barna research poll from last year, 2018, revealed that, strap yourselves in, 51%, so just over half, the majority, 51% of, of U.S. churchgoers are not familiar with the term, the Great Commission. Now, depending on the age in this room, that will strike you with varying levels of shock. Let me explain what I mean by that. So 25% and these are churchgoers, by the way, and churchgoers in this survey are defined as people who have attended church services at least once within the past six months, which is itself, will, that's an entire other sermon. But of those people, 25% of them could recall the term, but not quite tell you what it meant or what it referred to. It, it sounded familiar. Great commission. Well, that sure sounds like a churchy thing. Sounds like the type of thing I, I should know. Maybe you recalled it from your days at Sunday school, but couldn't quite go on to explain what it was or what exactly it referred to. That was 25% of them. 65% were unsure at all. They either hadn't any idea what the term meant, or if they had thought of, the, if the term did sound familiar to them, they could in no way, shape, or form point you to what it is. Only 17%. All right? Only 17, less than one in five U.S. church-going Christians in this survey could identify not only what the Great Commission is by term, but then show you what it is in Scripture. Shocking. In a congregation of 100, think of this. There are not 20 people who know what the Great Commission is. Now, Brayden, why are you on about this? Why has this got your blood fired up? Because on the surface, this would seem to indicate exactly what I have been talking about. We are not employing our language, and therefore, we have no idea what it is that we're supposed to be doing. And worse yet, as I hope to show you, we have lessened our idea of who we are. 
Surely you say people knew the Bible passages behind the term, right? Surely they knew that this was in scripture if they didn't know the term itself. Well, let me tell you this. The researchers then presented these American churchgoers with five different passages of scripture, right? So if whether or not they knew it off, off the top of their heads, they were then presented with a multiple choice, five possible scriptures. And these are not, I looked at them, they were, these are not obscure scriptures. These are like John 3.16. Uh, these are Jesus summarizing the Ten Commandments, right? The greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is this, love your neighbors. So, like, these are all really familiar passages. Anyone, you would look at them and go, yeah, I, I, I know that or I should know that. They were presented with five different passages, and then they were asked to pick out the Great Commission. One of those was actually this passage out of Matthew 28. Could they pick out from five? Well, one-third of them could. <laughs> one-third of them could. 94% of the ones who actually knew what it was, they picked it out from the page. I don't know about the other six. Everybody else either didn't know which verses to pick, or they picked the wrong one. Now, age, this is why I mentioned age. Age, apparently, is an enormous factor in this. 29% of what they call elders, I'm sorry, elders, and uh, elders would be, uh, I guess, if you're over 80, you're an elder, because they're different from boomers. The, the boomers are now kind of in their 70s now, all right? So 29% of elders, I'll, I'll let you place yourself on that chart. <laughs> I won't do it for you. 29% of elders and 26% of boomers say that they know the passage, which are horrible numbers. But only 17% of Gen Xers, that's me, we're all in our 40s now, right? maybe our early 50s. Only 17% of Gen Xers and 10% of millennials can boast the same. All told, not half of any age group knows the Great Commission. And the youngest of the adult generations is the worst <coughs> off. There is currently not enough information about you Zetters, that's you guys. We don't have enough information about that. But if we track these numbers, we see a definite downward slide. You guys will probably come in at less than 10% unless somebody does something. You will continue. It's not your fault, by the way. It is not your fault. But looking at the data, our children will continue our slide into biblical illiteracy. And that's what gets my blood fired up. Now listen, I am grateful for researchers this. I'm grateful for people who do this type of thing. Because it holds a mirror up to us. And it invites us to look into that mirror if we dare. And I say if we dare because we may not like what we see. And indeed, this morning, we should not like what we see. What can we conclude from all of this data? I have three conclusions for you. Firstly, we are clearly failing to give younger generations of Christians a thorough education in the Holy Scriptures. And in fact, even as I wrote it out this morning, Holy Scriptures is yet another term that I don't think I've heard in a decade. Secondly, there is obviously a failure to employ, as I have said, the terminology that distinguishes our faith from that of every other. And thirdly, the Great Commission is clearly not being expounded upon enough to the point where every Christian, no matter their age or their experience, is familiar with it by rote. Now, as with all failings in this manner, I take responsibility. And by that I mean that if Christians have become increasingly ignorant in matters of doctrine and in the tenets of the faith, it is because those standing in the pulpits of the land have failed in their duty to adequately feed the sheep and to one day be able to present them before the throne of God as mature in Christ. Let me ask you this. Who is to blame on the farm if the livestock wither away? Who gets the blame? Who deserves the blame? The animals for eating poorly? Or the caretakers who did not give them all the nutrients that they needed in the first place? It's not the fault. It is not the fault of contemporary Christians that they do not know what the Great Commission is. The fault lies in those who should have spent three generations teaching them what it is. 
ensuring that they knew. President Harry Truman, I'm sure we all know this, he famously had a little sign on his desk. And on the side that faced him, it said, I'm from Missouri. But on the side that faced out, it said, the buck stops here. And so when responsibility is passed on, passing the buck, there eventually comes a place and a person to which it cannot be passed on anymore. That person needs to accept ultimate responsibility. And for Truman, that was the office of the president. The buck stops here. And I'm starting to think that something very similar should be engraved right here across the top of every pulpit in the country to remind those who dare to stand in Christ's stead of their responsibilities. Therefore, as one who does take his calling seriously, that's why we come to Matthew 28. This morning I'm going to ensure that you not only know the term the Great Commission, but you know what scripture it points to, and you will be able to know what it means for you in your Christian walk. So let's break down these few verses, all right? Let's just, uh, we'll just kind of expositorily go through it step by step. As we've said, this scene is taking place just after the one we looked at last week. Last week we looked at what's normally called the, uh, the reinstatement of Peter. Right? Peter has said, I am going fishing, as his response to the resurrected Christ, basically saying, I quit. I'm going back to my own life. And because he is a natural leader among the 11, for the moment, because he's a natural leader, generally where Peter goes, the others will follow. And so we find when we look at the end of John that not only has Peter gone fishing, but all of the former fishermen have also followed him, and Thomas as well, for some reason. Thomas, Thomas as well. But there are four disciples missing out of that story. Where are they? Well, as we looked at last week, it turns out that None of them were supposed to go down to the sea at all. They were to go to Galilee, yes, but they were supposed to go to a mountaintop, which one we are not specifically told in Scripture, but they were supposed to go to a mountaintop, and there Jesus would meet them. For that's, This would mark his third appearance. Instead, his third appearance ends up being down by the Sea of Galilee. But they're supposed to be on a mountaintop. So he comes down to the Sea of Galilee at the end of John's Gospel, and he gathers those lost sheep, including Peter, and says... You know why you didn't catch any fish? It's because I control the fish. I control everything now. Whatever glory I have laid by, I have picked up. I need you to come up to this mountain, and I will explain further. And he does. He does. Take a look at verse 16. So it is possible that this is the mountaintop that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15, where 500 believers saw Christ at one go. It's possible. We can't say for sure because it's not mentioned here. They don't say Jesus took them up to the mountain where everybody else was waiting. But we do know, because of the inerrancy of Scripture, at some point during these 50 days, Jesus did appear to 500 of the brethren. Otherwise, Paul's statement would be false. Was it here? No one is entirely sure. There are some hints in verse 17 and 18 that indicate it might be, especially given the fact that Jesus has to present himself to some who don't believe. Everybody worships him, but there are still some holdouts. There are still some holdouts. That seems somewhat incredulous, given that this is the third time now that Christ has appeared to the 11, that there would still be one or two holdouts. We... The story seems to indicate that Thomas is the last of the holdouts, and then Thomas is, uh, amazingly enough, the one who comes to the greatest confession. So I'm just going to offer you this. It could very well be, please do not discount the possibility, that there is more than the disciples here. And this may be very, very important. Here's, Here's actually what Paul writes. Just let me give you this from 1 Corinthians 15. He was seen of Cephas, that's Peter. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve... In 15, verse 6, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. But we can't be certain that this is that moment. Matthew's text makes it sound as if we have here a meeting between just Jesus and the 11. But this uncertainty, this is why I mentioned this, all right? This uncertainty, is it just Jesus and the 11? Is it Jesus and everybody else in Galilee? We know from the years of ministry, Jesus had a much greater following in Galilee than he did in Jerusalem. And this uncertainty has given rise to an interesting debate in some circles. 
Is the Great Commission, are these words which follow meant just for the disciples, or are we in the larger church to lay a hold of them as well? Believe it or not, there is actually debate over this. I won't go into all the various arguments in detail. Just suffice to know that there are some out there, there are some out there who would try to tell you that the commission was a task specifically given to the disciples who will very shortly become the apostles. And they will try to argue that it is therefore not the church's mission to evangelize people. I see frowns. That's good. That's, that's good. This argument simply doesn't hold water, but I want to make you aware it's out there. And when you ask why, they will say it was just the disciples on this mountain. This is just a command given to the disciples. All right. So this morning, I refute that, and so should you. Let's get that out of the way. Why do we refute that? Because Scripture doesn't hold that up. All right. Scripture shows us that from the very beginning, Christians took this command en masse, whether or not they were there that day or not. It, they, they pick it up. They learn of it, and they pass it on. In Acts 8, 34, for example, the church is being persecuted now, primarily led by Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul, but the persecution, meant for evil, God, in all his ways, uses for good. The persecution drives the church out of its cradle, we could say. And now it starts to actually fulfill what Jesus said. These people are now, because they're running for their lives, but at the same time, they are becoming witnesses in Judea and Samaria, and eventually they get pushed further and further and further. The, the persecution becomes the, the booster rocket that launches the, the early church. But in Acts 8, we read this, that the early church is spreading out, yes, that it's preaching the word wherever it goes, but look at Acts 8, verse 1. The disciples remain in Jerusalem. So who's doing all the preaching? Everybody else. Everybody else is taking on the commission. Now later on, Paul affirms this again as something that all Christians are charged with. In 2 Corinthians, he writes this, All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Are we familiar with this little string of words? What is that ministry, Paul? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Say it again, Paul. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And therefore, he says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now certainly Paul is speaking in a kind of royal we, a kind of inclusive us. He's certainly talking about himself. He was, after all, the one who came to Corinth with this message of reconciliation. He's talking about himself, but at the same time, he's also talking about all of you, Church of Corinth, all of you future Christian believers who will read this scripture. You are included. I am with you. We are all in it together. It doesn't matter, Paul is saying, that I happen to carry the label of apostle. This ministry, this mission, this thing that we are to implore people to do is not my burden alone. It also belongs to you. The entire church is charged with this ministry. And if you needed one more proof, how about something from Hebrews? Hebrews 5, 12 through 13, shows us that all believers should be able to teach others the scripture. They should be able to walk people through the Bible. And in fact, if you cannot, Hebrews tells us that that is a mark of spiritual immaturity. Don't beat yourself up. It just means you've got some work to do. Now, what does Jesus say to them? Now we're at verse 18. Here's how he starts this off. Praise God. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Stop. This is so critical. So critical. Jesus says that all power, all authority in some translations, maybe you'll find, has been given unto him. By whom? Who else has all power and all authority to hand over? God the Father, right? So God the Father has now given the Son all of His, capital H, He has now given the Son all of His, the Greek word here used is exousia, 
exousia. And it basically means power and authority together. It is not, here's another Greek word for you for today, it is not dynamisen, which is another word for power. Dynamisen is actually where we get the word dynamite, right? Dynamisen is a power, but think of it as an explosive power, a display of power. Exousia is power, yes, but it's a power that carries authority. So God the Father has given Christ Jesus all of his exousia. And because Jesus has now been given this powerful authority, that is the only reason that he can say what he says next. So as we come to these two verses, which are the core of the Great Commission, we first need to realize that only Christ can give this commission. If you're following some other commission, I don't know what you're doing with your life. But it's not what Jesus wanted. And if for some reason you are holding on to an incorrect view of who Christ is and what power he holds and where he stands in the Trinity, likewise, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're following. Christ, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, as we are about to see, is the only one with the power and authority to give this commission. And what is it? Verse 19. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is it right here, these two verses. This is the Great Commission. And now, if a Barna Research Group happens to corner you, and asks you to pick this out of a list of five Bible verses, I am confident that each and every one of you will pass the test. 19 and 20. This is the commission. But I had a question as I worked on this through a Why do we call it the Great Commission? This, this term itself is not actually found anywhere in Scripture. Much like when we looked at, just before Easter, the triumphal entry. <clears throat> We know the term, we, I'm certainly hoping by now, we know to what it refers to, but where does, that, where does that term come from? Why do we call it that? The Great Commission falls into the same family. It does not actually appear in any verses of the Bible, but we need to remember that originally there were no chapter or verse breaks in Scripture when they were written. Those were all added later to make it easier for us to find stuff. So too were the various pericopes, you're learning all kinds of fancy words today. A pericope. It looks like pericope when you spell it out. A pericope. It's, uh, that's, what the, that's the technical term when you look at your Bible for the smaller bite-sized hunks of the chapters. So you may, depending on the, on the printing, you may in these scripture verses actually have a little subtitle above it called the Great Commission. And then we follow these verses. That hunk of this chapter is technically called a pericope. And over time, the various pericopes started to pick up these little subtitles. Again, not that they were written in there originally, just to make it easier for us to find and easier for us to learn. So where did this particular one pick up this particular title? It turns out credit probably should go to a Dutch missionary named Justinian, sorry, Justinian von Welts. He's probably the one responsible. Uh, von Welts lived from 1621 to 1688, and he had two passions. One, to reform the church, and two, to convert pagans. Good passions to have. It's, uh, it is him who seems to have come up first with the idea of a specific organization dedicated to evangelizing people who don't know Christ. Um, what we might call today a, a mission society. He seems to be the originator of that idea. And if that seems odd to you, take this on board as well. The church somehow went 1,600 years without having this idea. Why is that? So he was the first to come up with this idea, and he presented this idea to many in Germany in 1644, that this was something that the church should really organize and build and support, and it found no help 
He found no traction, so he went and did it himself. The very next year, 1665, he traveled to South America to go and convert the natives, and in 1668, he vanished somewhere in the jungles, never to be seen or heard from again. And that was the end of Van Wells. And then about two centuries later, this concept of a dedicated missions organization resurfaced. And this term, which he had probably come up with, but which had laid dormant, it came back to life again. And for this, we thank a British missionary named Hudson Taylor, whose name you may or may not know. Hudson Taylor spent 51 years evangelizing what was then a blank space on the map of Christendom, China. This is in the mid to late 1800s. He spent 51 years in China. He actually became fluent in at least three Chinese dialects and was instrumental in the first translations of the Bible into some form of Chinese. And ever since he came up with this, there, there is a quote attributed, to, it's attributed to him, but nobody can actually prove that he said it, that says that the Great Commission is not a choice, it's a mandate. And ever since, the idea and the phrase has become the basis of countless mission talks and seminars. But as I said, before that, for the first 1,600 years in the life of the church, what we call the Great Commission was not seen as a command to actively go out, find people who aren't believers, and make believers of them. So what was it seen as? Well, for the first 1,600 years of the church, the passage was taken, here's, I need to read this verbatim, it was taken as a Trinitarian foundation of ecclesiology. Blank faces, that's fine. Those were, that was really scholastic. My bad. Let me, let, me, let me bring that down, okay? There's a mention of the Trinity here. You will notice that people and new believers are to be baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, not the name of the name of the name of, as if there was some type of pecking order. They are all equal. And this is one of the first times in all of Scripture that Jesus, the Son, equates himself, puts himself on equal footing with both the Father and the Spirit. This is where our notion of the Trinity comes from. This is one of our fallback scriptures, in fact, for those who would deny the Trinity and yet claim to be Christians. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, particularly among them, who believe that Christ is a created being, hit them with this. I guarantee they're not. They're prepared for other, th for other parts of Scripture, but they won't know this one. It is a Trinitarian foundation of ecclesiology, the study of the church, the structure of the church, who we are as the church. So it describes who Christians are and what the church is supposed to be like and that we are all a part of God's mission. There's a man named Robbie Castleman. He wrote this. He said, this is not a passage about sending the disciples out to buck the system, take on the world, and save the universe. The Great Commission doesn't begin here or at Pentecost. It doesn't begin with Paul or when a Christian today decides on a mission agency to give to or to go with. The Great Commission began long, long ago in the hidden depths of God's own being. The heart of the Great Commission is this, that God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He has since before history began. And it is the culmination of all of history. That's God's mission. And that is the mission that we are told, not only we are a part of, because we have been baptized into that, but that is the mission that has been handed to us to continue. Now I want to show you, there are three what we call imperatives. Who are my school teachers here? Yes. There are three imperatives, or active verbs. There are three of them in the Great Commission. Okay? What's an imperative? Uh, an imperative is stop, run, right? I'm telling you to do something. That's an imperative. There are three of them in the Great Commission. Go is not one of them. Go is surprisingly not one of them. When we look at the Greek manuscripts, this verb here is actually passive. And directly translated, it says, having gone. Having gone, make disciples of all nations. 
So we might best think of it as this. Instead of go, exclamation mark, right? It's more like wherever you go or wherever you find yourself, wherever life takes you, do these things. Here are the actual three imperatives. Now, listen, this is not to say that direct admissions, I feel I need to quantify this. This is not to say that direct admissions have no place in the life of the church or in Christians. Indeed, God does bless those who have taken the call to put their lives and the lives of their families directly on the front line in the battle for souls against Satan and all the powers of darkness. But what we can say is that the commission is not something for them to do alone. Understand? In the weeks when we get up here and hear the missionary reports, we can never become the kind of people who have subcontracted out our mission to the experts. We don't need to be concerned with what's happening in Africa or the Caribbean or the Philippines or, I mean, Western Europe, I told you a number of weeks ago. Europe is now a mission field. It's become so secular. We never, never, never can be the kinds of people who say, somebody else will take care of it. Somebody else will do it for us. No. We don't get to delegate this particular responsibility. This is a command to all of us. It's simply that some of us are doing it in a different way. All right? Some of us go, some of us do go, exclamation mark. But the rest of us enact these commands wherever we remain. Now I said there are three active verbs here, and they are these. Maybe you can pick them out. Disciple or rather make disciples. Then we have baptize. That is a, an imperative, that is a command. And the third one is teach. Disciple, baptize, teach. Now very quickly, disciple. Methetes, this is the word um, used, as a, used as a verb. This means make followers. Make followers, make learners. Remember in other parts of scripture as we looked at the Beatitudes, the 12, the disciples, this is the same word, the, the methetes, the learners. These, these are guys who were coming out of the crowd, they were sitting close to Jesus because they wanted to learn, they wanted to develop their skills. You're, you're to go and to make learners. Make learners. And once those learners are ready to make a public profession of faith, we baptize, we baptizo. And as good Baptists, this is really a word. I mean, if we don't know this, we've got serious problems. Baptizo, from the Greek, to immerse. To, uh, in previous centuries, there were a group called the Dunkers. Because that's how they baptize, to immerse. The, the verb itself, interestingly enough, comes actually from the act of dyeing cloth. Right? So you'd have a vat of dye, you'd have cloth, you don't sprinkle the dye on, you don't take a little ladle and dip it on, you take the cloth and you submerge it. And you hold it there for a little bit, and then you pull it back up, right? <laughs> Baptizo, that is what we are to do when we make a public profession of faith. Right? The baptism itself does not bring us salvation, our faith, we are saved by faith. But what we do is that we are baptized so that everybody else can see, wow, this person has made a profession of faith? What happened? I knew them. I went to school with them. I grew up with them. It's a public showing. But only once that person has become sufficiently learned. And then the final one is teach. And this is something that we're always doing from now to the grave. We're learning we're, we're, we're being taught, even as we are teaching others. And what are we teaching? We're teaching to obey Jesus' commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you will right, obey my commands. To do as he did. To follow as he would have us follow. Listen, the Great Commission is clearly missiological. It does refer, it does talk about mission. But it is also ecclesiastical. It describes the church and the people who are in it. And both of these aspects of the commission have to be embraced. There are far too many churches in our contemporary setting that focus on one or the other. You probably don't have to think too far to come up with an example. In fact, we are chock-a-block 
with evangelical, in giant air quotes, evangelical churches that are just interested in accumulating numbers. So they gain converts. Maybe they baptize them. But they're more interested in you coming to Christ so that we can up the roll call by one or more. All they want is numbers. All they want is converts. That's too mission heavy. Right? But you can have the opposite in the other direction as well. And that's also just as unhealthy. You can have a church, and we have them. You can have a church that is so insular. It's just so focused on we're learning, we're going to become the best Christians we can, that it somehow forgets that it's also supposed to invite others in. That it's supposed to bring others in. It becomes too ecclesiastical. As you'll find in just about everything in Scripture, the middle of the road is where we want to be. Both missional and ecclesiology, right? both mission and church building together. Charles Spurgeon, you know, he's one of my heroes. He opened a college for a number of years for young, young pastors, and he, re he recounted this story. One of his students asked him this, Will the heathen who have not heard the gospel be saved? Right? Will those who have never heard the gospel, are they going to heaven, Mr. Spurgeon? And Mr. Spurgeon replied, It is more a question with me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not can be saved. In a 2019 Barna survey, I was really on the Barna website this week. I told my wife on the way up, everywhere you go, it's like a rabbit hole. One survey led me to another, to another, to another. But in a 2019 survey, many millennials today, it was discovered, are unsure about the actual practice of evangelism. Almost half of them, 47% of millennials, agree at least somewhat that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in the hopes that they will likewise convert and someday share the same faith. And this is compared to a little over 27% of Gen Xers. They, they think it's wrong to share the faith. And one in five boomers and elders is 20%, right? There are, so let's just say this. There's a significant portion and a growing portion as we go through the generations of people who do not want to partake in the commission the missional aspects of the commission. Why? Because they don't want to hurt other people's feelings. Three out of five Christian millennials believe that people today are more than likely to take offense if they share their faith with them. That's 65% of them. They would rather just maintain cordial relations than share the faith. That is higher than among boomer Christians that's only 28% of boomers are afraid. So we can see the way that the numbers are leading. And David Kinneman, who's the president of the Barna Group, he, he summed up these numbers like this. He said, cultivating deep, steady, resilient Christian conviction, granted, is a difficult thing to do in a world of you do you. And don't criticize anybody's life choices. It's difficult in a world of emotivism the feelings first priority that our culture makes as a way of life. As much as ever, evangelism isn't just about saving the unsaved, but reminding ourselves that this stuff matters, that the Bible is trustworthy, and that Jesus changes everything. Close quote. George Whitfield, the great evangelist of the 1700s, said this, God forbid that I should travel with anyone a quarter of an hour without speaking Christ to them. God forbid it? Absolutely. Jesus said this himself in Matthew 10, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father. But whosoever shall deny me before men, and let's, let's expand to that, whosoever can't be bothered or puts the feelings of others ahead of the great and glorious gospel, who denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Paul, in Romans 10, wrote that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
And how shall they preach except that they be sent? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We all want to see the church grow and flourish. But here Paul paints a backwards logistical chain that should shame all of us. How is it supposed to flourish if we don't actually go out and tell people the good news? They will not come of their own, for no one is righteous and no one seeketh after God. This is why those who bring the good news, whether they have intentionally gone or whether they are bringing the news wherever they have been planted, wherever it may be, those who do this are called beautiful. It is a privilege, a privilege to be called to take part in God's personal mission to help in some small way fulfill his desire to see all men saved and come to that knowledge of the truth. We are all of us laborers called into a variety of fields. So this morning, let's get to work.